Over now to hear more from our speakers about the big Azure announcements from Microsoft Ignite. Hello and welcome. I hope you're enjoying the first day of the European SharePoint Conference. For the next 40 minutes, you are in the company of myself, Rick Hepworth, and an esteemed panel of experts and friends that I'm very pleased to have with me. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So I'm going to start. Magnus Martinson, would you like to say a bit about yourself? I would. Hello. Welcome to the conference. I hope you're enjoying it. My name is Magnus, and I am working as an Azure consultant. So I'm an Azure MVP, been for about a decade now. Um, I'm also what Microsoft like to call a regional director. And um, my day, to day day job is that I'm a, I'm a consultant, uh, and I, I'm currently consulting with uh, some um, you know national security level infrastructure in in uh, in Denmark, in fact, uh, around building uh, Azure Enterprise stuff. And sat next to you on my screen is Sasha Kranjac. Sasha, would you like to say hi? Hi, I uh, hello everyone. I hope you're enjoying the conference as well. Uh, happy to be here. And my name is Sasha, and um, I'm also uh, an Azure MVP and doing consultancy, uh, mostly uh, mostly dealing with uh, Azure and security, and um, and Azure security as well. So uh, teaching teaching too, uh, longstanding MCT uh, as well, and uh, EC Council instructor and et cetera et cetera. So uh, security is my uh, my my thing, and and Azure as well. And next up, we have the marvelous Adi Polak. Adi, say hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Uh, so I am Adi Polak. I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. I specialized in distributed data, uh, machine learning. Before working for Microsoft, I worked as a software developer building infrastructure for big data, so massive uh, amounts of data. And actually, before being a software developer, I worked as a machine learning researcher. I know it's a jump in totally different areas, but yeah, I did that and I uh, Back then, it's specialized in machine learning and solving cybersecurity problems using machine learning. So I'm happy to bring knowledge here today and share it with you all. Wow, thanks, Eddie. And last but by no means least, sat in my corner, um, Donald Hessing. Hello. Hello there, and uh, welcome at the SPC Online. Um, so yeah, my name is Donald Hessing. I work for NK Gemini based out of the Netherlands, and I'm uh, leading the Microsoft team. Yeah, so in my responsibilities, it's uh, Office 365, Dynamics, but uh, also a large part of Azure. I'm uh, a Microsoft Certified Master for whatever that still applies uh, back in the days. And uh, I'm also uh, your program chair for ESPC. All right, so thank you very much. That's our esteemed and wonderful panel. So the brief for this session is to discuss the, the new and interesting announcements that were coming out of Ignite and, and the, the rest of the sort of the Microsoft quick find news that we're all currently drowning in with a conference a week, right? And um, one of the things that really struck me about Ignite, the, the, the keynote that I really enjoyed the most, I, I don't know about you, was, was talking about Microsoft premonition and the development of AI and big data. And I'm, I'm interested in what what the panel think. Have we we're, we're reaching that point now where the cloud can enable us to do the most wonderful things in terms of collecting huge volumes of data and processing it and doing stuff with it. Do you, the panel, think that the tooling that's available is developed enough to to really enable the average development team to take advantage of this great stuff in their own projects? And and if so, how? Where are we going with it? Um, Adi, I thought you might like to kick us off with that. We're given your background. Absolutely. Um, well, there are many tools today that exist, and it's a nice combination between what we see with the different Microsoft platforms and what we see in the open source. So the way I see it, the way we construct it is a lot of people are combining different services like Azure Machine Learning, like Azure Co Cognitive Services and other services to enable them to build a whole suite of, um, you know, to build their architecture with a whole suite of different services combined with open source technology uh, that exists for that area. For example, you can see uh, Apache Spark, which is an open source that helps us process a lot of data. So it helps us with the compute part of everything. You see different, um, 
open source in the in the world of, of machine learning like uh, SkyKit Learn or uh, Apache ML, uh, Apache Spark ML, and and many more that helps us kind of do this build our machine learnings and later on we can leverage things like the Azure machine learning uh, platform to help us in uh, introduce auto ML as well so we don't always need to have these experts on machine learning we can actually leverage the auto ML part and kind of do what we call the lightweight the more the lightweight um, workloads and kind of sift through the basics of machine learning and when we go back to our uh, data science team, we can actually tell them, hey, listen, we already see through a lot of the different basics that you usually go, and now you can focus on, on the main thing, on, on the business logic and how to improve that part uh, with machine learning. And of course, there is the deployment part, and a lot of people always talk about how I can take my machine learning model and productionize it. And this is also another challenge that people sometimes face because there are many file types when you produce a machine learning model it can be different file types that we have there we need to package it we need to containerize it we need to deploy it and azure machine learning uh, helps us as well in that area and we can actually deploy it directly to uh, containerize it and deploy it directly to azure kubernetes service on top of that we have uh, the cognitive services that help us kind of utilized a lot of machine learning models that can be expensive to produce and the reason why these are expensive because they require massive amounts of data so you need to store that massive amount of data but you also need to run the machine learning algorithms on on these massive amounts of data and it usually means that you're going to use gpus and i don't know if you know but gpus are expensive <laughs> I mean, it thousands thousands of dollars to to run uh, GPUs and to actually process this <coughs> amounts of data. And it, it, most often, you don't use only one GPU. You use multiple GPUs because you need a distributed uh, learning environment. Yeah. So, uh, cognitive service definitely helps and kind of bring the already made up machine learning model uh, for a lot of a lot of folks to just uh, take it in and and use that. And sometimes it's not just to use it as the machine learning model sometimes it can be used to enrich the data that we work with for example if we use um, like images or uh, things like that and we need to classify those images to enrich our data to start with before we can jump into the actual machine learning process that we want to do in the organization we can leverage already made up functions for us so cognitive services and other services that exist that already gives us this data so we don't need to kind of you know work it out from uh from the basics we can already have this enriched data that we can take later on to our more um progressed machine learning that really targets what the business wants um, so yeah, a lot of exciting things in my opinion. So actually, mm -hmm. Donald, you, we were talking before we, we started the session, weren't we? Cog services is kind of your thing as well. What's what's your take on it from the, the perspective of somebody who's consuming those services and using them to build solutions? Yeah, I think that's what uh, Adi <coughs> explained there. I think if you look at cloud and the agility that organizations need in these days, that, uh, yeah, you need to provide that agility and speed within your uh, organization and apply that to your uh, to your applications. And uh, one thing I think that uh, allows you to do with cognitive services is at least to experiment with AI models that are already built for you. And uh, yeah, so, so the examples of vision or maybe things like uh, speech to text, uh, these these are quickly at hand and very easy to adopt uh, within your application. So let's say in scenarios where you may, might want to move uh, from the style or the way you interact with your application from mouse and keyboard to, to speech, you can simply, simply take the, the speech services and say, okay, I want to do text to speech uh, and uh, speech to text back as a, as a command line uh, to interact with your application. And yeah, a variety of examples, I think, that uh, in a day-to-day -day basis uh, can be used by using the cognitive services. Right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, what I what I really enjoy about that is is how it's 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 essentially democratized, right? So there are so many investments that had to be made on the lower levels to to achieve this height that we're at today. 
Um, I mean, talking about things such as storage and just like the very, very fundamentals, the very basic things, and but also to to transport transport and move that that type of data, all the networking and everything that goes into that. It's 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 really really impressive uh, the way that this has now built up so that with these building blocks we can build anything, and now we can rent GPUs by the cycle, and and all of a sudden it's it's available for everyone. It didn't used to be this way, but now with the cloud, it's actually there. Anyone can reach out and touch that. We didn't have that before, and some pretty cool out of the box, almost like you know, almost drag and drop like scenarios for for the higher cognitive services that you can just they are they are now really handy to work with that's that's changed that's yeah. that's it would it was never like this before <laughs> yeah, i fully agree yeah. Yeah. And, and they matured as well huh? so, so if yeah you look at, uh, and, and, and for start, example yeah, yeah sorry so, sorry so where they started with with let's say basic computer vision models right that allows you to identify about 10,000 objects and landmarks. And then you yeah, you can go yeah. all the way to custom vision where you can say, okay, I want to build my own classifier or I want to yeah. have my own image collection to detect my custom objects. Uh, and you can actually do that uh, with, a, with a very simple, straightforward uh, either the user interface yeah. or the API first approach by uh, utilizing the APIs and upload your images, tag them and train them uh, yeah. as such. And, and I think the power is also very clearly visible in the complete eco ecosystem of Microsoft. Yeah, so if you look at uh, power, the whole power platform that is now also utilizing the same cognitive services, and those uh, that are aware of Project Cortex and uh, SharePoint Syntax. So under the hood, Microsoft is now also uh, utilizing that same power <laughs> of their own pre-built models. Uh, so I think. Yeah, uh, the beauty is there. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to. Yeah. So I, I just re really want to tap into uh, what you said, Donald, about breaking uh, breaking the silos and enabling different services to be used in different areas. So, like we have Azure, but you can use Azure services and consume it in the Power Platform or in other areas and other services. So, I, I, I personally really like that that there's no silos anymore, and and we can define and decide which building block we want to take from which platform. And even if you take an, an, an end user, for example, and all, all these things that we mentioned in AI and ML, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, if you use, if you take a regular user, uh, PowerPoint user, Word user, there is a trans transcription and, and, and direct transcribe uh, transcription of what the user is saying or presenting. And there is a d designer, uh, in in board recently announced and in PowerPoint there's have been uh, for some time and other things uh, that have been developed in in the background algorithms and and methods and and uh, everything that is applied also to other uh, areas that are not directly in contact with end users for example like uh, um, um, malware detection and and threat detection and and and, and so on so uh, it's pretty intertwined like uh, uh, as I said, it's um, mm. there's no there are no boundaries actually between these services and and features. Yeah, and I believe many of the <clears throat> developers overlook the capabilities of these services yeah, because they started with simple models, uh, and now there's so much functionality in these cognitive services that yeah people that initially looked at it now are overlooking. Uh, so for example, you can now and crop your images based on an interest area. So it automatically crops your, inter your image based on what computer vision thinks is the most interesting area, mm. uh, as an example um, to, be, to be used. Uh, we can digitize our forms, right? So extract name value pairs and store that in a Cosmos DB for later processing, uh, things like that. So, so making forms digital and, and then having, yeah, relational data coming out of it is really really powerful uh, capabilities that require you to months of yeah programming <laughs> uh, which are now at your fingertips yeah. it's also like strange detection algorithm. using the coolest thing for the most mundane solution hey machine learning artificial intelligence to fill in a form <laughs> um, 
one thing I, I just want to ask on the topic of machine learning, big data, though, um, it's great power, right? It's really cool. Is there great responsibility that comes along with that? Are there aspects that I should be thinking about as a developer, maybe where the data is going? How am I using it? We've all seen conversations on, on Twitter, for example, lately about um, image recognition or, or automated cropping of images where it, it gets it, it gets it wrong. Have, have you got any advice as a panel as, as rather than just developers rushing headlong into plugging all this stuff in their app? But is there advice of, of how they should do it and how they need to be wary and mindful of this kind of stuff? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're tapping into the area of, uh, of ethics. Uh, uh, ethics and AI, and it's it's a huge area, and it basically means that everything that we do in AI that is human centric, we need to pay a lot of. Uh, you need to we need to give it a lot of attention because we a collect data that related to people, we b process the data. Um, See, we produce machine learning models and then we give other people to use them. And there's always uh, um, an error rate in every machine learning model that we create. There's always an error rate. So we need to understand what this error rate is and how it might impact how we use the machine learning. And on that note, uh, Microsoft also released an open source uh, named FAIR AI that helps us understand better how our machine learning works inside. Like, you know, usually we look at it as a black box, so they try to make it into more of a, a something that we can actually see and look how the uh, how our model makes decisions and can help us, you know, human beings understand how we can take that machine learning model and uh, put it in production, deploy it to production in a safe manner so we won't, um, you know, so we can be the most sensitive uh, that we can in, in that space. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to move us on a little bit. Um, still, ironically, sort of staying with the power of the cloud and being driven by things like machine learning, um, security, security tooling, and not just things like antivirus, the, 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 the whole panoply now of, of, of available security services in, in the cloud is, is great and growing. And I'm, I'm interested in, in, in that from, from two points of view, really. Um, what does the panel think of it? Is, is it? is it a great thing? Does it really bring, bring the benefits that it purports to of, of you know, having this perspective from outside our organization looking in so we can see threats we can't? Or, or is it just another growing, confusing array of brand names and service names that I don't know where to start? You know, what advice can we give to people as to how they start to adopt these services effectively for their organizations? Um, Sasha, I was going to point to you to kick off the discussion on that one, since it says security <laughs> expert on your CV, your CV my friend. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I would like to quote uh, Steve Riley. Um, uh, cloud is like everything you've uh, used before, except that everything is completely different. So it's uh, and actually it is. And uh, uh, all um, uh, you know that um, today. I would say roughly 95% of the companies and, and, and users, individuals are in the cloud. And but um, what I've what I've uh, stumbled upon and 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 uh, it is the mindset that it's still from 20 years ago. It's still uh, on premises mindset. It's still mindset that thinks in between four walls and, and it's no longer like that. So. Um, the discussion of of cloud security is very complicated because it's get it because people don't get it um, still uh, their responsibilities their roles what it is and where where's the line between cloud provider responsibility and and uh, responsibility of, of a user and that gets tougher and tougher and 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 and, and worse uh, I would say because um, you know that although your data is not anymore in on your computer. Your your data is not anymore at your place. Your that data is not under your control, so it's not your data anymore. But uh, any cloud provider and Microsoft, except uh, especially, uh, gives you the power to know where your uh, your data is and gives you the tools to secure the data and to govern the data and 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 so on. So it's uh, up to us to actually take control of the data and and think differently so uh in fact like steve said it's complete it's the same but it's completely different so we we we, we have to think a little bit different so um it's it's not about i used to say uh, it's there is no one big switch 
and where you, you just go and pull that thing and then you're secure. It's um, rather uh, securing uh, all the small things all along the way and then that gives you the big security. But uh, there is no such thing as completely secure system. It's uh, about two things. It, it's about increasing the time and increasing the money uh, for the bad people to get to your data. So if we turn all the knobs that we have, it will take the unusual amount of time that and and to get your data and by the time that the bad persons get your data that that, that data might not be um worth uh, anymore so hence they will not actually target you but uh the the bad people usually uh, uh, lowest hanging fruit and and we know that so we we need to turn uh, all the things uh, on the security things and speaking of that um i think uh, microsoft is going the right way because it's uh, as as they are as microsoft and other uh, cloud vendors are um in inventing uh, features inventing um capabilities enhancing their products also the complexity enhance uh, uh is enhancing so we need to have one central place to uh, rule them all and the in the azure it's azure security center for the infrastructure and there's azure sentinel and also there's ai and ml that helps us and uh, all the telemetry that uh, microsoft gets uh, that works uh, toward our, our benefit that uh, also is here to um, to tell us about the invisible enemy so uh, our data is out there and and there are different attackers and different uh, different threats to our data so we we need to think differently and we need different tools as well so these are the tools that 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 uh, that will help us and you mentioned there is abundance of uh, features and and things that we need to secure but i should say uh i say any any start is is good start as long as as we start securing those things security center will be one one thing uh that we uh can use to start at and there's also uh there uh, there are also uh, a lot of um security and uh, announcement being made here at um, Ignite 2020, uh, some new branding experiences and uh, new uh, new features um, that uh, result as a, uh, for example, uh, like IoT security that has been ramped up uh, by inquisition of uh, CyberX and integration and some uh, expansion of uh, Azure Sentinel capabilities, etc. Uh, new uh, new uh, Azure Security ben benchmark is here new key vault capabilities and and also double uh double encryption for data trust and transit so uh, i'm sure uh these are just general security things that have been announced but i i uh, i believe there there have been some others as well like a new uh a new in uh, acting director like new um conditional access uh, uh features are here available for us as well as well as the others uh, like uh small improvements but in fact that as we accumulate them and and uh turn on the security switches on them as well like sql and, and other things as well and um uh, uh, iot or data or um others uh, ml as well devops especially uh we we should be secure yes uh uh what are your experiences in 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 other fields like ai or uh databases or uh other or in development Hmm. What does everybody else think? Magnus, you've usually got views on things like security from an architecture perspective and helping okay. your customers. Well, the thing is, the thing that I like uh, in, in all the things that you mentioned, so many uh, things are, are out there. One that I really like is the, the Sentinel solution, which yeah. is a solution built on top of, um, it's a SIEM, right? So it's, it's a solution built on top of the log analytics workspace. And uh, what's really cool about that is that it has a model of connectors, which, and there's now, I don't know how many connectors, there's lots, both the third party and a lot of Microsoft connectors. So essentially what anyone would need to do to start using a seam for, for, uh, for uh, their cloud uh, security so, uh, solution is to, to install that, or just to activate the Sentinel solution in the, in the, uh, the log analytics workspace and then start connecting you know act uh, configuring these connectors for azure ad for instance and and other things and then that will just pull in 
so much data uh, that yeah. no no human could ever process it. And that's what the solution is for. It it qualifies uh, the the all that security data and and finds uh, likely suspects so that humans can begin to actually process the 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 real uh, suspicious exactly. activity and 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 ignore because you cannot put, with all that data coming at you. There's no way a human could see one tree in the forest, right? They only see forests. And so you need to qualify it. And that's that solution, uh, the Sentinel solution. And uh, it's, uh, it's relatively in this space, relatively actually honestly young, but it's already very qualified as far as I've seen so far. And, and the really UBE uh, as well, uh, option and, and capability like user entity and behavior analytics mm -hmm. as well is like you said, uh, seeing the the tree in the forest actually yeah. so yeah you can yeah it's really cool so the the, the to, to again to play devil's advocate as my my position allows me to do um <laughs> this stuff is great right it but it, it's really e easy to turn on but then it's also really easy to be flooded with information right flooded with warnings flooded with guidance don't know where to start. Um, have any of you got any recommendations for how I should how I should tackle this? Is 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 there a, a happy path of start simple and, and increase the complexity? Are there places I can go to find advice? You know, how would you suggest that I, if I've never used this stuff before, actually go and, and try and take advantage of it? Well, if I may take it's uh, Azure Security Center, and uh, there's also a number that actually will tell you how good are you compared to yesterday or a few hours ago. So that's very good. And there's a list of, yeah, and, and, and enough is 365 or Microsoft 365 as well. So there's a secure score that tells you based on your current uh, environment and infrastructure and posture, what, how are you doing good in, in terms of security? And there's a list, of course, of the things that you should do. Um, mm -hmm you probably won't ever clear that list off and because some things will never apply to your environment or um, yeah. for the specific reasons for um, it, either it's time consuming or it's uh, costly and, and so on or it doesn't make sense but at least you can go through the list of available things and yeah. then start taking off one after the other so just look at the list and and do the easiest thing or the the most simplest or whatever you do is going to be better than it was yeah, before. Yeah, exactly. You you learn as you go here, right? And I, and I find that I'm, exactly. I'm happy you brought that up because the the responsibility of any project team that is going to start using Azure in, in a serious way is to ensure that there is a process, a team, a person, or people that have the job to go into security center and work that number towards zero. And then you learn as you go, right? So if there's new stuff popping up there that wasn't there yesterday, why is that red light blinking? Oh my gosh, right? let's take a look at yeah. that. Don't, 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 how does that work? And then you learn as you go. And uh, well, you know, before you know it, you have yeah. expert experts that are experts in security, who knew? <laughs> Yeah, my take on that is uh, <clears throat> start with uh, the basics first, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, as you mentioned, Rick, it's it's a tremendous amount of tools, a tremendous amount of logging. But uh, yeah, similar to what you did on premises, start with the basics, understand your risk appetite, uh, and then uh, boil it down to uh, from your application all the way down to your infrastructure. I think it also depends a bit on where in the Azure stack your application sits, uh, right? Is it on the SaaS level? Is it on PaaS level? Is it on EaaS level? That also depends uh, and defines the tooling uh, that you need, right? If, 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 are you on EaaS and you need to provide your whole networking there as well? You're on a completely different layer uh, than if you're building an application on, uh, on let's say, SaaS or PaaS uh, level. Uh, what we uh, see happening at the moment is that there's also significant risk in what we know, what we call Azure DevOps or CICD pipeline attacks. Um, so we put a lot of focus these days on, let's say, the infrastructure part of it. But we, on the other side, we also need to have automated deployments and things like that. Now, the attack surveys of your CICD pipeline <coughs> might be more risky. 
uh, than, we, than we might think. Uh, so start with the basics, use your head, uh, and maybe create the different layers that you have, including the data, not to forget, uh, and then take your measures. Uh, and enable MFA. <laughs> <laughs> if you only do what you do. Well, I'll start with the basics. Yeah. 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 Believe it or not, it's, it's, still, it's still number one um, vulnerability, um, not having MFA. So. Yeah, true. Yeah. Passwords, what's wrong with passwords? Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I don't know, I'm going to go and we'll tell you what's wrong with it. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you my password and you can tell me if it's bad. <laughs> okay. Admin one, two, three. Yeah, that's right. And on that bombshell, I'll make a little, next question. So <laughs> it, it's interesting that you were talking about the done things like CICD, Magnus. You were talking about start simple. Um, in my experience, it's really, really easy to 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 have your cloud experience not go the direction you want it to. Um, and again, we we mentioned a, a little bit before we started recording this session, there is guidance out there, right? Microsoft produced things like the cloud adoption framework, the well-architected framework. Um, I'm interested in your experience as a panel in terms of the customers you work with, the organizations you advise, how you help them adopt the cloud sensibly, how you help them put the practices in. What right. do you think of the documentation that Microsoft are producing? Is it is it helpful? Is it useful? Again, is it just too much and it's too daunting? Um, mm. What do we think of that and what advice can we give to organizations in terms of um, responsible adoption of the cloud, responsible management of the cloud, that kind of thing? Right, that's that's my day to day job. Uh, I'll jump on that for sure. So um, the 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 flavor of the month, if if I'm going to be a little bit uh, mean, is is a, a, a um, cloud center of, of excellence, a CCOE. Uh, that's that's typically what I hear people talking about now. We should have a cloud center of excellence, like it's a thing. Um, but at least um, what they mean is that they have every intention of being experts using the cloud, right? They're being being good about it. And uh, specifically with that, um, now pretty massive and, and kind of in that sense, also kind of daunting uh, a cloud adoption framework that Microsoft has put together, right? It, it contains so much goodness, right? There's They have distilled and brought in feedback and stories from various uh, companies, enterprises, partners, and kind of they put this together in a, in a large set of documentation. The good thing about it is that it covers a lot of ground, right? So you can use it as a, you should be using it as a reference case, right? So, oh, right, I didn't think of that. We have to, you know, um, enable multi-factor authentication. Didn't think of that, right? So you get like checklist upon checklist. It's, it's not formatted as checklists, but really, I mean, there are so many things that you should be, you know, at some point you have to talk about it. Some point you have to get to it, whatever it is, right? And it helps you with, with early aspects such as planning, the things that you maybe didn't think about to when you made that decision, the boardroom decision happened to go to the cloud, right? It's a technical thing. We'll let the tech guy sort it out. But what they didn't think about was that they actually had to retrain some of their staff, right? There are other aspects, other things that you didn't think. And so that the cloud adoption framework, while being big and kind of almost difficult to, you know, reading through it is almost not even tangible anymore. But um, but, but really, uh, you, you get checklists, you get help, you get directions. If you were to be able to read through all of that and kind of implement that A to Z, you would probably get a solution that's not good for anyone, honestly. Uh, you need to take that massive chunk of advice and process it how it relates to you. And at that point, it's also good always to have enough experts in the room. If you don't have them, train them or hire them or, or, uh, or find them somewhere, consult them, it doesn't matter. But you should also, with with that, you should have enough people in the room that know what to do. It's going to save you a ton of time and, you know, going more towards the goal uh, rather than trying to, uh, you know, study the, the cloud adoption framework and learn as you go. That's a little bit too difficult. So there's a lot to do there, but but on, um, the guidance gives you a lot of help. The well-architected framework gives you a lot of help as well gives you architectural examples of things, right? So how did they, what challenge did they have and how did they approach that and which things in the Azure, you know, 
abundance of different Azure services did they actually use to build that thing, right? Did they use uh, cognitive services? And you know, what what are the things that they needed? There's so much in there that that you need to learn about, but you can start fairly small and improve. Exactly. Yeah. So do you think that advice extends all the way sort of up to management and down to developers? If if we're doing different roles, do we need to look in different places? Do we have different areas of concern, if you like, areas that we ought to be focused on given what we do in an org? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if if you're doing it right, uh, it it's if you're doing something serious with the cloud and you haven't yet done that, right? As an organization, there are many of those out there that haven't yet done cloudy things, but now they're doing it because you know everyone is. So we're doing it too. Um, it's way too late to be the the early adopters, right? That's already happened. Uh, you're coming towards the, the 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 later end of the you know. There's there's still many companies that haven't done much, and. Um, if you're going to do it right, it's going to touch everything that you do. It doesn't have to be dramatic, right? They can be pretty straightforward for any organization, but there still there still can be some drama involved, especially when it when it, when humans are involved, right? There drama can happen, right? All of a sudden, somebody is not comfortable in their position anymore in the company, and they may need retraining, and you know, there's there's things that can happen. And so, if you are doing it right. Uh, if you're doing it seriously and you know on a on a significant scale for your size company, uh, then it's going to touch everything that you do. Okay, and as as a follow up on that one, then because <clears throat> I get this question a lot, there are lots of tools in Azure to help me with governance, and a lot of organizations think they should take a tools first approach. Um, whereas things like the the CAF and the WAF are documentation, and I don't necessarily need to use software tools to to use them. Um, again, given the panel's experience, which do we think that either of those is the right way, or is, is it a bit of both? You know, where should we start if we haven't got any governance guidelines, safety rails, that kind of thing? So basically, I think that depends on the person. Some some people are super comfortable with CLIs and working from there. Some people are super comfortable with working with the, you know, a UI and then the Azure portal can be great help to start understanding what the different services that exist and tweaking the different areas. So it really depends on the person and where they are coming from. Some people are, you know, will be um, <clears throat> very keen on writing maybe some Python co code and trying the different APIs directly. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to uh, to do that, and it's, in my opinion, it highly depends on you know where we're coming from, what we're used to, what we like doing, uh, and what is what what's easy for us, basically. Yeah, that's true. That's a great that's a great point. Uh, basically, you could use any any technology today. You know, I'm I'm having a lot of fun explaining how the uh, uh, the management API works uh, for people. Because it doesn't matter which tooling or whatever uh, you're using, if you're using the Azure portal, you're using CLI, if you're using, doesn't matter. All of them at the end of the day have to communicate with the RESTful endpoint of the management uh, API. There's there's no other way to control your Azure. So you can actually go and talk to that API directly, um, authenticate and, and send RESTful uh, HTTP requests to that endpoint. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, there's there's tons of tooling and your, your choice, right? You can write uh, things that govern your applications. You can write that in code in multiple languages. Um, if you don't like CLI, use PowerShell because you know both of them are open source and bo both of them are used by uh, are uh, maintained by Microsoft, which is weird, but here we are, right? Because the 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 Windows crowd uh, were accustomed to PowerShell, but the Linux crowd went PowerShell. We're never doing that, and so now Microsoft has two uh, uh, command lines, right? So you know, whatever you like, it's it's probably going to be fine. <laughs> All right. So we've got just a few minutes left. Uh, I I thought we'd try and end on a slightly lighter note. We're all cloud consultants, cloud advocates, cloud experts, right? So there's a menu out there of cloud services that we all use. And, and what I thought I wanted to do for a quick a quick fire finish, what cloud service in that Azure menu 
do you think is so great that you really, really wish you'd been the one that got the credit for inventing it? And oh, wow. Uh, Magnus, <laughs> your top, top left corner. I'm going to start with you go around clockwise. Oh, you're going around. Okay. Um, wow. Okay. I'm going to. Oh, that's, that's that's difficult, but I'm going to go with a sneaky. Uh, well, the, the first thing I thought about, actually, I, probably because I was thinking about it in terms of the API before. So I've been doing uh, things with ARM, the Azure uh, Resource Management and ARM templates for a long time, so I can do it really well. I even um, built some custom training that I've been uh, training people to how to use ARM and how to set up automation for the cloud, because automation is a is a powerful and important thing that you need to do. Um, and and then, you know, to my dismay, there are some people that think that think that that JSON files and ARM templates, it's it's difficult and complex. And 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 I don't know what's what's up with that. I find it easy. But anyway, um, now Microsoft is building a, a DSL. So it's not they're not the first ones to build a, a, a DSL to make it easier to use ARM. But um, and it's it's been done by competitors. Uh, but now Microsoft is building a, a transpiler, if you will. Uh, they're building a new language, a domain-specific language for creating resources for managing resources called Bicep. And uh, Bicep literally is very declarative, simple statements in a simple language that makes it easy for anyone to consume. Which then you run a transpiler on, and out comes uh, ARM template files at the other end. I should have, I should have, I should have thought of that. <laughs> so so Magnus claims bicep as, as the thing he wish he thought of. Um, Sasha, uh, I'm well. I'm I'm um, I like math, and uh, uh, I wish I, I I invented all all the algorithms and and for the ML and AI down there, uh, and uh, so because they they give so much power and beyond what we actually see with the naked eye. So you you can. You, you can get out of nothing. You can get something with with math, with algorithms, with with, with the data, with with processing. Whether it's a simple um, text to speech, or whether it's uh, uh, predicting something, or um, threat hunting. So it's um it's an interesting future and an exciting thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Add add. Well. Wow, okay. Um, well, I think for me it will be Azure Synapse. And the reason for that is, well, it's not GA yet. It's still in preview and I'm super excited about that. Um, because uh, it helps us simplify the way we work uh, with data at scale. So the modern uh, data warehouses where we can plug in and connect different data storage. So let's say I want to work with Cosmos, I can I can bring it in or I want to work with just blob storage. I can I can link it in and it's also super helpful with um, all the security around that. So if I if I need a service principle to connect uh, to a lot of things, then I can just click a few things in Synapse and for me and and that's great because i don't need to I, i'm not a big fan of clis but if i i do need i'll do that but you know if it they give me this ability to do everything from the from the synapse ui and from the synapse dashboard then that's great i just clicking a few things connecting all the different data sources that i need putting together the warehouse and more than that, it's it's scalable, and I have uh, a way to run different um, SQL queries uh, in a serverless mode. So I don't have to pay for SQL all the time. I can just use it in a serverless and pay for what I'm using. And I think this is huge because um, a <laughs> We don't like to uh, pay for services that we're not using. So the fact that we're able to pay only for what we consume is great. And B, it's scalable and helps us uh, store yeah. huge data. So it's not the mm -hmm. usual SQL server that we used to have. It's now like really massive amounts of, of data uh, that we can store there in an organized manner. And then, you know, we can do whatever we want from there once we have the data in and structured. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Lastly, Donald, top Azure Synapse. What do you wish? Yeah, so we already covered cognitive service, so I will take my second pick, and that's uh, in line with Addy. Um, I really love the simplicity of Azure Functions. Uh, to be honest, 
Um, so having that serverless uh, consumption-based model, uh, allowing you to deploy kind of pretty much all the popular languages out there uh, at the moment, so including uh, Python, JavaScript, Node.js, whatever uh, .NET Core you would like, uh, and the lightweight of that Azure service uh, that, that kind of ensures you that you are following the modern cloud uh, patterns like uh, microservices or Saga type of patterns. Um, having that flexibility to quickly deploy something with limited cost, uh, having the flexibility to scale at a level that uh, yeah, wasn't possible in, in, in on-premises world or with simplified uh, yeah, images in, in, uh, in IaaS. I, I really love that, uh, that that simplicity of Azure Functions. That's great. And on that bombshell, uh, we've reached <laughs> the end of what was a great conversation. I'd, I'd like to, to thank the members of the panel, Magnus, Sasha, Addy, and Donald. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. There's lots and lots of great content coming up both today and tomorrow. So sit back, relax, and tune into the panoply of experts that are here to, to entertain and educate you. Um, I've been Rick Hepworth. You've been wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs>